colleague Susan Chalmers here is helping me to do this. It's really quite disconcerting to have people sitting at such a wide... I need a wide-angled set of wide-angled eyes so that I can see everybody. If you, if you could come closer to the front, that would be marvellous. Don't feel obliged. We're going to start in about a minute, maybe two. I just want to use the extension. Please come towards the front, ladies and gentlemen. It'll be easier for us to see you if you come and sit near the front. So thank you all for making the effort to come. We're going to start the open mic session. The idea is that you come to a microphone and there are a number dotted around the room and you can talk about anything at all you want to talk about in respect to the IGF. And if that doesn't work, you can talk about anything you want to talk about at all. So... Who wants to be the first person? You can talk about anything that's happened this week. You can talk about a workshop that you were in when you, when you learned something. You can ask questions. You can talk about main sessions. You can talk about the IGF itself. You can give some feedback on how this week has gone and whether you thought um, the, 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 the facilities were good and the organization was great and was the main room too big and all of that stuff. It's truly, truly an open mic session. You can talk about anything. There's a gentleman who has his hand up, so if you go to the microphone, sir, you can, yeah, you can speak. And, and if everyone else would like to form an orderly queue behind this gentleman, we'll get started. So if you could introduce yourself and uh, tell us where you're from, that would be great. All right. Thank you so much for the opportunity. My name is Hisham Al-Mirat. I am a Director of Global Voices Advocacy, also known as uh, Advox. Uh, I've had a wonderful opportunity throughout the week and uh, I've made a lot of contacts and networked with a lot of like-minded activists. My main frustration though uh, is, uh, has to do with the fact that a lot of civil society uh, organizations, uh, so-called civil society, uh, I, I, I came to the realization that some, a lot of them masquerade as civil society organizations, but actually they represent, most of the time, private interest groups or are sponsored by their own governments. Uh, most of civil society organizations I know uh, come from Morocco. I'm a Moroccan national. I don't have the resources to, flow, uh, to fly all the way, back, all the way to, to Bali, but they still can send emails. And... 
Sorry, I was just going to ask, um, you, you had said so-called civil society. I was wondering if you wouldn't mind defining um, civil society and how you see it. Well, it, most, most of the time it has to do with the way they are financed, the way they, are, they, they, they find resources to send people to wonderful ven venues like this, these ones. Uh, so I, I can speak of, a, of one group since I'm a Moroccan national. Uh, there's a lot happening in Morocco. I struggled. Actually, there are, there are supposed to be two Moroccan delegates here in Bali, but I struggled to find them. Uh, I don't know if they're in the room. They must have checked their high tide bulletin. Uh, must be at the beach. But in any case, uh, there are things happening in Morocco, and if you allow me just two minutes. Yes, go ahead. Uh, to read one statement from one civil society organization based in Morocco called Manfakinch. For the record, it's M-A-M-F-I-N-K-I-N-C-H. That's the name of this organization. Uh, so, on September 17th, uh, Mr. Ali Anuzla, a journalist uh, and the Arabic language editor of Lacom.com, uh, a popular online publication and also a journalist known for his critical reporting of the highest political figures in Morocco, was arrested after he published a link to an article in the Spanish paper El País, which contained a link to a video attributed to Al-Qaeda in the Islamic Maghreb, also known as Akim. Mr. Anuzla was held without charge for a little over a week before being formally accused of, quote, material assistance to a terrorist group, advocating terrorism and initiating a terrorist act. Mr. Anuzla is now being held in a prison in Casablanca with convicted terrorists pending his trial. The case of Mr. Anuzla has sparked an unprecedented campaign of support, both nationally and internationally. Now Mr. Anuzla's site, Lacombe.com, and several mirrors of his site have been reportedly blocked in Morocco. The arrest of Mr. Anuzla and the apparent ISP level filtering of his site and those of his supporters mark a major setback for freedom of expression in Morocco, which has in recent years prided itself by, uh, in, uh, in recent years has made strides increasing in, uh, internet access to its citizens and pulling back online censorship. The February 20th movement, the country's version of the so-called Arab Spring, operated mostly online and mostly freely. More recently, the king's pardon of a convicted ped pedophile led to a massive online campaign that ultimately forced the monarch to rescind his pardon, an unprecedented move in Morocco's, Morocco's recorded history. Uh, so, Manfa Kinch condemns Morocco's violation of freedom of expression and press freedom. Uh, we consider the charges against Mr. Anuzla to be unfounded under international law, and we call for the immediate release of Mr. Anuzla and for charges against him to be dropped. We also call for Morocco to lift all ISP filtering and online censorship in the country. Thank you so much. That's fine. Thank you very much. I have... Uh... Hi, my name is Shadi Abu Zara. <clears throat> um, uh, I've been asked through the Dynamic Coalition on Accessibility and Disability to just give an update on the report. Um, I want to uh, report that um, from our perspective, this has been one of the best IGFs so far in terms of accessibility. We really want to appreciate the host country for all the work they're doing, uh, particularly on a fairly short turnaround, I think, this year in particular. Uh, also the IGF secretariat on all the work that they've uh, put in and, and, and the effort. Um, so we're really seeing a lot of progress, a lot of uh, improvements in terms of accessibility and inclusion of the IGF. Um, th there have been issues, particularly uh, with, with, with the connectivity and the remote participation uh, this year. Unfortunately, even though the bandwidth uh, has been pretty good, it was more technical issues. We will report on this in, 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 in our report and, and also uh, update our guidelines for future IGFs, uh, but we really wanted to acknowledge and thank the host country for, for its work. Thank you. It's, it's really nice to receive um, positive feedback. Um, um, Ma'am, would you like to um, yeah. make a comment? 
Yeah. I'm Doliu from China, so later I will speak in Chinese. So please use the earphone. Sure, we'll just watch the transcript too. Okay, thank you. 我是来自中国工业和信息化部的刘多 首先我代表中国代表团再次感谢本届IGF会议东道主印度尼西亚政府的周道安排感谢联合国IGF秘书处的精心组织工作 关于本次会议，我想谈以下几点看法。第一点是在本次会议上，多利益相关方参与的互联网管理机制已经成为共方共识。政府、国际组织、社会团体、私营部门一方都不可缺少。但是各方的责任要明确。目的必须是为了公众的利益国际社会广泛关注的互联网大国门监控事件我们要寻找一个新的方向这是全球普遍的共识。同时，我们也必须认识到，发展多边等原则对全球互联网发展也非常重要。我们欢迎巴西倡议将于2014年4月召开的互联网大会。相信这次大会将会为全球互联网的发展和治理做出新的贡献。谢谢。Thank you very much. And the next person. Hi, Chris. Uh, Jim Prendergast with the Galway Strategy Group. Uh, question about the new GTO. Wait, that's another meeting in a few weeks. <laughs> um, First off, I do, want to, I do want to start off by thanking the organizers, uh, the Secretariat and the Balinese Host Committee. I thought the, the logistics of the meeting ran extremely well. Um, you know, security was, it was excellent. The food, plenty of food and coffee, I think that's an improvement over last year, something that people certainly appreciate. Um, the bandwidth issues, while not perfect, I think were a, a vast improvement over years past as well, so that's to be congratulated. Um, the other thing I wanted to talk about was sort of the uniqueness in the different formats for sessions. Um, I, I uh, moderated a flash session that was extremely interactive. We only had 30, 35 minutes, but we had probably 25 youth speak, which is something I think that was unique amongst all the other panels out there. The kids walked out of the room very excited, very energetic uh, compared to some of the earlier sessions that they were in. So encourage the um, continued use of those types of formats. Hope more panelists will try and use them in theirs because as an audience participant, it certainly makes it a much more worthwhile experience. Thank you. Thanks, Jim. And I can tell you that outside of this convention center for people who are looking at the Twitter feeds, et cetera, et cetera, that session was, um, ex sounded extremely interesting. And I've had people say to me, that's the one thing I wish I'd been at because it just sounded as if they were 
It was a really great session. So congratulations. So we can all go home then if no one has any other comments. Oh, sorry, there's a closing ceremony we have to have. But this really is an open mic session. You can talk about anything you like. And I'm not going to take, to take too much longer before I start calling it quits. So is everyone, no one has any comments on the IGF? Nobody wants to respond? No one's got anything to say about the session this morning? I can see somebody standing up and leaving the room. No, walking to the microphone. Just if we can hang on for one second. We have a, a statement that we want to share, but the person who's been asked to read it on behalf of our group may not be in the room yet. Sure. Because we came rushing in from one of the many fruitful sessions that we've been able to have. So uh, if I can just ask your indulgence for... I'll indulge you with pleasure. Thank you. Thanks, Chris. Pinda Wong, Hong Kong. Um, this is my first IGF. I've been an IGF skeptic for many years. Um, I'm glad that I'm no longer an IGF skeptic, given the, the dynamics I've seen this week. So congratulations on a, on a great event. Um, just like the Flash session, I think in terms of looking at format going forward, one thing you may consider is keeping presentations to a minimum. Uh, you know, just maybe one or two minutes. That was the problem that we had in our session. Uh, there's so much expertise in the room um, that, if, 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 if I may, if you can try and find mechanisms to encourage dialogue, that'll be great. Because, again, there's so much talent here, it'll be pity not to tap into that. Practical suggestion, again, is making sure that everyone's read the papers um, before coming. Because, again, just looking at titles and turning up to the session um, may not always sort of result in the best kind of interaction. Thank you. Pindar, thanks, and just so you know, uh, the thing about long presentations is the thing that we say every year to everyone, say, please don't make long presentations, this is supposed to be interactive, and every year some people make long presentations, but I completely agree with you. Thank you, Norbert Bolo. I'm one of the coordinators of something called the Civil Society Internet Governance Caucus, and I would like to, actually it's Polo, not Paolo. Um, I would like to quickly react to the thought that some so-called civil society organizations are perhaps not what many people think of when they hear civil society. And what I would suggest in response to that is to create a new stakeholder category, multi slash other because there's, if we sort of establish standards for what is civil society, these standards should not have the effect of some people being denied, being anything. Everybody should be able to allow, uh, be allowed to voice their concerns, but maybe not everybody should uh, call themselves civil society, right now, if you don't fit anywhere else, you get registered as, as civil society. That might not be the best approach. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so think about, I mean, I'm really interested, actually, Susan asked a question earlier on, and I'm really interested in people in this room. If, we, if any of us have the faintest idea what the definition of civil society actually is, um, I, I just assume it's everybody, but um, I don't know. Olga. Thank you, Chris. Um, thank you for giving me this opportunity. My name is Olga Cavalli. I'm representative of the government of Argentina, and I would like to thank the host. I think it has been a great meeting, a great place to, to hold this meeting. And uh, I would like to thank the Secretariat for all the work. Um, thank UNDESA for also all the work they have done. I would like to thank all the colleagues that invited me to moderate or to talk in their, in their workshops and also those colleagues that worked with me in organizing the um, access meeting and uh, the access uh, main session, focus session. It's a jet lag, sorry. But at this time of the day, it's very strong. 
Um, I would like also to announce as a university teacher that we are organizing the, for the sixth year the South School of Internet Governance, this time for the first time in the Caribbean, in Trinidad and Tobago, in the frame of the 25th anniversary of the Caribbean Telecommunication Union. The call for applications for fellowship will be open very soon in our webpage, governanzainternet.org. So we will welcome uh, candidates from Latin America and from the Caribbean. And uh, we have trained more than 300 people so far in these six years. So uh, we are very happy with this uh, new Caribbean stage of the project. And thank you very much. And it has been a great meeting. Thank you, Chris. It's Olga, Olga, before you go, I just wanted to ask you a question. I was wondering, um, I'm, I'm curious because I was wondering, or, or to any other um, government representative um, in the room, what, why governments um, come to the IGF and what the value is um, from a government perspective? Well, it's a good question. I, I must say I am kind of a multi-stakeholder person, not a governmental person. I am also a university teacher. I am also active in our Internet Society chapter in Argentina. I'm the secretary. And I also active, I'm a board member of the National Center of Engineers. And there I have created a, a commission for women and engineers. So I have several activities. I cannot say myself that I am a fully governmental person. So I find the beauty of this meeting uh, for being multi-stakeholder and for being equal footing. I think that's unique. And that's the fantastic uh, beauty of the IGF. And I've been so privileged to be in all the eight IGF, and I was so privileged to be representing my country in, in, in Tunis in 2005. So um, I think that governments come to the IGF, uh, those governments that are, are willing to come, uh, and trying to understand this new model of interaction. But I think that multi-stakeholderism already happens. If you think of all the projects that happen in all the countries, uh, like fiber into rural areas or doing IXPs or, or cooperating, integrating content, local content, that, those are multi-stakeholder projects. Those are somehow a partnership in between the government and between private companies, uh, academia, technical communities. So um, we shouldn't fear for multi-stakeholderism because we already have it in, in our lives and technology is blending all that. So I think that governments come here to share experiences, to learn and to participate in equal footing in this beautiful meeting. Okay, thanks, Olga. Thank you for the question. Raise that up a little bit. Probably would have been easy just to take it out of the stand and hold it, but anyway. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm Buzian Zaid from Morocco, and I'm reading the statement on behalf of 20 civil society leaders from 18 different countries in the Freedom House delegation. The 2013 IGF provided a valuable space for the members of our group to engage with other stakeholder groups through the forum sessions and also through side meetings and consultations with representatives of governments, businesses, the technical community, multilateral bodies, and civil society organizations from all over the world. We urge all stakeholders to continue to engage and participate in future IGFs to strengthen the forum's multi-stakeholder process and to uphold the principles of openness, transparency, and inclusiveness. Without the IGF, there is no comparable venue for civil society to directly raise its perspective and concerns with leaders in the government, the private sector, and the technical community. We share the sentiment with the vast majority of IGF participants that the Internet governance process can and should be improved. 
but stress the importance of, uphold, of upholding and strengthening the multi-stakeholder approach to ensure that the Internet remains open, global, secure, and resilient. In calling for more efforts to promote, protect, and advocate for human rights online, our group has underscored three broad principles and recommendations. First, all laws, policies, regulations, terms of service, user agreements, and other measures to, to govern the Internet must adhere to international standards of human rights, including but not limited to Article 19 of the UN Declaration of Human Rights, guaranteeing the right to freedom of expression. Article 12, guaranteeing the right to privacy. Article 20, guaranteeing the right to free association. As an important step, states and other stakeholders must look to Human Rights Council Resolution 28, adopted by consensus in July 2012, affirming, quote, that the same rights that people have offline must also be protected online, in particular freedom of expression, and pledging to explore further, quote, how the Internet can be an important tool for development and for exercise in human rights, unquote. This applies to ending illicit online surveillance by any government. To be legitimate and lawful, any surveillance must be limited, targeted, used to deter or investigate criminalized activity and subject to independent judicial oversight. Second, consistency across the many spaces for discussion around Internet governance issues, including those spaces clustered around regional, sub-regional, national, linguistic, and other groupings, is crucial to ensure the principles of openness, transparency, and inclusiveness are upheld in all venues. This is not multi-stakeholderism for multi-stakeholderism's sake, but rather recognizing the need to represent all voices, perspectives, and interests in setting standards, norms, and policies that affect the Internet both locally and globally. The term multi-stakeholder is overused and applied to a wide range of events, groups, and processes. Various international organizations, as well as national governments, must make, must make it a top priority to replace lip service to multi-stakeholderism with genuine efforts to bring all stakeholders to the table on equal footing. Third and last, transparency and accountability. Transparency and accountability are the crucial next steps in the Internet governance discussion and need to be fully implemented by all stakeholder groups. Businesses are beginning to recognize transparency reports as serving their users and their corporate social responsibilities as well as their bottom line interests. Governments likewise should ensure that their policies and practices are fully transparent as a means of preserving their legitimacy credibility and moral authority with their own citizens and the international community. In instances of content censorship, surveillance, shutting down or deliberate slowing down of networks and other methods of internet control, these two stakeholder groups must work independently and together to divulge details about these measures and have them open to public debate. In addition, Government should institute strict controls on the export of surveillance and filtering technologies to regimes that have failed to demonstrate a commitment to upholding human rights, while the private sector should take a closer look at some of their own practices in this domain. In some countries, bloggers, activists, and other Internet users are subject to beatings, imprisonments, and even murder when they post information critical to the authorities. We thank the government of Indonesia for its warm hospitality and dedicated efforts in successfully hosting the eighth annual meeting of the global IGF. Despite the confusion during the summer over whether the event would be held in Bali, we were able to convene our delegation of civil society advocates, activists, and academics from, from more than 18 countries. However, three of our colleagues had to cancel their attendance owing to visa issues. 
the letter granting certain registered participants permission to obtain visas upon arrival in, in Indonesia came too late, was rejected by airline officials, and was not extended to participants from all countries. For future IGFs, it would be preferable to announce the visa on arrival special, on arrival special procedure well in advance and officially notify the appropriate channels. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. See, we have um, Mervi over on the other side of the room. Is that you? Would you like to go ahead? Yes. Yes. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Mervi Kultama. I'm from uh, the Foreign Ministry of Finland. Um, and uh, basically, I wanted to reply to the question of why governments come to the IGF meetings. But first, let me share my appreciation for this year's IGF and uh, what a marvelous job the Secretariat does with, uh, with uh, such scarce resources. Um, uh, but uh, from foreign policy perspective and for, from my personal perspective, why I come to the IGF meetings, um, I uh, am interested in discussing about how the present multi-stakeholder internet governance uh, model can be further developed and strengthened. This is my first point. And the second uh, topic of interest uh, is uh, how uh, internet can be harnessed for uh, the benefit of developing countries, especially the least uh, developed countries. And I'm glad that development uh, stays as cross-cutting issue in each IGF meeting. And the third question relates to human rights, which we have um, uh, discussed in length also this year's, in this year's IGF, and how the respect for human rights and, and freedom of expression um, apply on the internet sphere. Um, and I think that IGF really provides a marvelous opportunity, basically the only opportunity that we have globally to interact with peers, but also with all stakeholders on these uh, issues. And, and uh, this year's debates were uh, in particular very constructive with the Brazilian initiative, and, and, uh, and we look forward to uh, the follow-up to that. Uh, a point of concern that I wanted to share with all is the IGF uh, funding, since um, the IGF is currently uh, functioning on half of the budget that it really needs. And uh, one of the problems is that uh, there has been no possibility to uh, hire a new executive coordinator. Uh, now there is a positive development in this regard uh, that uh, uh, two foundations are to be established to accept uh, small donations. So uh, I hope, hope that all stakeholders uh, put their money where their mouth is and, and, and really reflect on possibilities to help and, and to fund the IGF to make it stable and, and to make sure that we can come here to enjoy the discussions also in, in the future. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think we'll, um, sir, oh, would you like to go ahead? And then to, over to you. Uh, this is Mashir Rahman. Uh, from, uh, I'm representing uh, Shikko.com. It's an uh, education platform. And this year we got the ISIF uh, 2013 award. Um, I, as a uh, IGF, uh, sorry, IGF, I'd say as a global platform we are facing a lot of challenges but I'd like to uh, highlight one of the challenges that we are facing is we are uh, all the content about in the internet is mostly in English uh, how we can address the local people with the local content in this context shikhov.com we are working with the local language Bengali to distribute education material uh, to the to the blind people, poor people, remote people who don't have access or cannot even go outside of their room, our house, or go to the city to get the educational resources. So I think IGF is doing a wonderful job, but IGF, uh, I think 
I just need to address these uh, local challenges, the local people. Although we, through the effort of the IGF, we got now got the connectivity in the rural area. We got excellent connectivity. But why, what we will do with this connectivity if we do not have any good content, if we do not have any resources in local language because our local people cannot understand English. They cannot even understand how the Facebook is working. So IGF, uh, I think IGF also need to address, uh, beside the other issue, need to address about this local languages or local minor people. I think Indonesia, like Indonesia, a lot of I island is there, local people cannot interact in the English language. So this is the big challenges for the local people like us. So I look forward to uh, how we can work together to address this problem. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks for your intervention. Thank you. Um, do you like, oh. Yeah, uh, me. Okay. Go ahead. Uh, hello, my name is uh, Jackson uh, from Vanuatu, uh, Pacific Island country. Um, I do acknowledge uh, the organizers of this um, IGF. Actually, this is my first IGF, and I am really delighted and happy of uh, what, what's been discussed throughout the week. Um, I come from a government policy development kind of work, and while we continue to talk about multi-stakeholder, developing countries do depend a lot on the government for uh, basic services uh, as well as uh, infrastructure, etc. Uh, as government, we do uh, have continuous battle with civil society, with which we are yet to define what it is, but to keep things going. And from my view, our responsibility as the government is to keep and to ensure that services reach our citizens, taking into consideration that we do have competing priorities such as climate change, global warming, infrastructure, health, education, etc. Government has an important role uh, in the multi-stakeholder model setting uh, to ensure citizens contribute to the policy development process. And something that we've found that's been very helpful in this multi-stakeholder is involving everyone in our decision making and ensure everyone has a role within the multi-stakeholder. Uh, just referring to the question, why governments attend IGF? Personally for me and from my personal view, um, I think governments should be taking the lead in the uh, multi-stakeholder model setting to protect the interest of our citizens with continuous dialogue with the civil society. And overall, our role is to develop policies that encourage investment uh, and growth of ICTs and telecommunications as well as other sectors. Doing this in an open, transparent and accountable manner. And finally, my additional comment is to reach multi-stakeholder cooperation and to bridge the divide, we must keep working together with developing countries like the Pacific region. And we need capacity building and support, and we need to join hands to deliver projects in small island states. Thank you. Thank you, Jackson. Um, for, for those of you who have uh, just come into the room, this is the open mic session. We've been discussing a number of different topics ranging from the session formats. Um, we've heard a few prepared statements and um, a few answers to a few questions. So just please feel free uh, to, raise, to raise whatever you'd like to, to raise relating to, to the IGF. Um, Norbert, I believe you're next. Yes, thank you. Norbert Polo, Civil Society Internet Governance Caucus. I wanted to quickly respond to the question that has been raised, what is civil society? And to do so, I want to quote from a document that speaks to this, which has very significant credibility. It is the Council of Europe's Code of Good Practice for Civil Participation 
in the decision-making process from 2009, and it says that, well, it talks about something called NGOs, and it, it defines it to refer to organized civil society, including voluntary groups, non-profit organizations, associations, foundations, charities, as well as geographic or inter interest-based community and advocacy groups. The core advocacy of, the, sorry, the core activities of NGOs are focused on values of social justice, human rights, democracy, and the rule of law. In these areas, the purpose of NGOs is to promote causes and improve the lives of people. It goes on giving much further good stuff. Please contact me if you want the full reference. Thank you. All good, thank you. So I get that and that's great. Is it limited then to NGOs or is, or is there space for it? Hang on, let, let's, let's just let that percolate around the room. We'll come, we'll come back to it. Otherwise, we're going to spend the whole time talking about that. Sala. Thank you, Chris. Uh, Sala Tamani Kawamaro for the transcripts. I'm from Fiji and I'm speaking uh, on, for, on my own behalf. I'd just like to say that um, well, one of the core things about Internet Governance Forum for me and one of the, my wish lists uh, throughout the years uh, has always been effective, meaningful participation. And in the context of the numerous issues that have been percolating uh, throughout the week, uh, it, it's all the more critical. Uh, whether it's increasing uh, the number of uh, countries represented in the gap within ICAP, or whether it's um, increasing uh, participation from underserved regions. Of the 193 countries, at least 90 of those countries are, are from developing uh, uh, regions. And uh, most of them aren't here or at least represented. Having said that, it doesn't take away the need for dialogue and, and continued and sustained dialogue. But just to add to that, I want to be officially on record that I don't think that multilateralism is a solution to enhance cooperation. Because if you take an analogy where parents who try to legislate children's behavior, it just makes them rebel all the more. But what we can certainly do as a community, and again I'm speaking just on my own behalf, what we can certainly do as a community is celebrate at least the more than 10 years of practical examples of enhanced cooperation. But what we certainly cannot dismiss is the need for increasing accountability and transparency, particularly in relation to the critical uh, and conflicting issues that people are not comfortable to discuss and be prepared to dialogue. Thank you. Thank you, Salad. Gentlemen. My name is Bernard Adongo. I'm uh, uh, from Kenya. Um, um, this is my first IGF. This is my first IGF, and um, I wouldn't be participating if I wasn't, uh, uh, if I didn't receive a, a fire award. The Cedar Alliance, uh, one of the members uh, is a fire, uh, had, uh, done by Afrinic. Uh, it has been just a, uh, it's, it's been a, I'd really like to express my gratitude to be able to be part of this. Uh, it has really, really opened my eyes, uh, and I think it is, it is a, it a tes testament to IGF that uh, you can involve people who are really working at the very fringes. Uh, because what I do, I run a company called Nico Harbor where we do customer engagement. We help businesses engage with their customers, where we bridge, we use SMS and, uh, and we use the internet to bridge everything together. And I think in, the, in a lot of the developing countries, a lot of people um, consume internet uh, through SMS and, uh, and I think it is, it is kind of sort of genius to be able to involve people from other people. We, at, the, at the very fringes, I was, I was uh, with other Cedar Lands uh, recipients, award recipients and uh, grant recipients and I, I realized that they are all working at the very, very fringes of something you might not call mainstream internet. So 
I think it was really a, a, a good experience for me. Uh, the other thing is, even some of my fellows in the Cedar Lands have mentioned, when you're involving new stakeholders, it is, it is important to, uh, to bring them in in, in organizing the, uh, the way their sessions are, are, are going to be so that they, are, uh, they make more impact and they're able to benefit more from, from basically uh, the whole system. Otherwise, it was, uh, I've really enjoyed the sessions. It has widened my mind. Uh, it has grown my scope, and uh, I'm so grateful for the Cedar Alliance, Afrinic, and, and IGF in total. Thank you. Uh, Vlad? Thank you, Susan. My name is Vladimir Vladunovic from Diplo Foundation. I wanted to convey three messages that I've been asked to. Uh, two are from the workshops, and one is a personal message. Uh, the first one refers to capacity building. Today we had a capacity building workshop and uh, there was a general feeling that throughout the IGF, especially the main sessions, high level sessions, a lot of representatives of the governments and private sector, also the others, uh, kept using very frequently capacity building, capacity building, capacity building. But however, our feeling was that this has become a bumper sticker a word which has been used without too much follow-up on that. And in our discussion, we wanted to emphasize that capacity building is far more than just the training or just bringing uh, people to IGF, which is all relevant, but that um, it is a complex process which involves uh, in-situ training, online training, uh, tutoring and mentoring, uh, training for trainers, evaluation of trainings, community building, um, fellowships, uh, immersion, policy immersion, and opportunities for newcomers to dive into the process. Uh, this is a complex process. It requires a lot of fundamental support for the organizations that are doing capacity building, uh, including finances, to be able to sustain these, these efforts for the IGF, and this comes as an invitation, especially for governments in the private sector to support capacity building more than they just talk about it. The second message comes from the workshop on e-participation where we explore the opportunities and limits or as our friend Bernard would say, not problems but challenges of remote participation. Uh, firstly to thank to the IGF Secretariat and all the crew for really giving their best for the e-participation to work but then also emphasizing that without a bigger support from the whole IGF and again all the stakeholders to support e-participation as a fundamental process, again not just a service at the IGF, but the process between the two events of evolving people into the process is a must. And uh, maybe to support this, we are not talking only about remote participation but also social media and the other. There are recent statistics from, I think it was this morning, about the Twitter uh, feeds basically said that it was 25,000 people that tweeted IGF 2012 or IGF, uh, sorry, 2013 or IGF 13 hashtags within these couple of days, tweeted or retweeted, um, and that these tweets managed to get to about 10 million different followers on IGF, on uh, Twitter. So IGF was found around and we need to capitalize on the, on the strengths of the social media and e-participation. And the last very short message by Deirdre from Santa Lucia, and now I'm acting as her avatar, she explicitly asked me to, uh, besides all the stakeholders, mention users, users, users. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, it's important to, uh, for these terms, capacity building. Thanks for explaining that for, for those who may not um, be familiar with the term. And thanks also for those um, statistics. That's really, that's really exciting to hear. Um, uh, we'll have the gentleman in the blue shirt and then in the white shirt. Thanks. Okay. Thank you. My name is Walter Natus. And maybe it becomes confusing, but I'm speaking as a personal, uh, personal role here at the moment. But I would like to give some observations just that I've seen on the, the past four days. I think the first one is that I'm very happy to see that the things change here that you just up front that there's no longer the Kuwait form because that was very exclusive for everybody else in the room, uh, I think. 
Uh, the second thing is that, that over the years that I've been to the IGF, that the most interactive workshops were where the, the, the moderator disassociated himself or herself from the panel. So in other words, a very direct interaction by moving through the room, one-on-one -on -one questions and comments, and then you get a great discussion and debate, and usually with good results, because you really hear the things you want to hear. So the stock taking we did this morning with 40 questions and then sort of answering half of them were an answer, which may also not be possible. But that's on what I saw. I think on topics that we heard in some workshops that there's a lot of associations or companies or not here because they just not show up at the IGF or they don't know that it, it, it exists. Perhaps it's possible to do some serious stock taking over the coming months to see who would we want to have here next year. So what we heard before, uh, for example, is that we missed the, the, the software uh, the vendors here because they, and the developers, we missed them here. We miss law enforcement here. They, we talk about them, but there's no response from the room uh, in, in most workshops. So there has to be something in the topics next year that makes it interesting for them to come, but also it is a possibility then to, to, uh, to discuss with them and the problems that some people seem to be having. I think the other one, I think that, is, that may be a thing for the IGF to do, and I'm going to give the example on IP, IP version 6 here, but uh, I've been to a meeting last week, and it's a very personal reflection, but I heard we're not doing IP version 6 because the call center manager of a big company says I can't handle the people that are going to call to the call center. And then I thought, it can't be true that you're writing some sort of a manual for the call center and not talking to the CEO saying it's about time you start doing IP version 6. So in other words, do we talk to the right people in some sessions? So could there be some of the topics at a higher level which is of people are present here to make them understand why it's important to change IP version 6 or do on spam work on spam law or do more on cybercrime but that they understand why that topic is on the agenda and not just the lower level civil servants that go to a workshop and then you talk to the same level and we go home and we've discussed it uh, nicely. So that's maybe something that we could think about. Well, is it possible to do a little in-depth session for people who don't understand it but are at a level to make differences? And the, the last one is that I'm very happy that all the presentation of the IETF, the Internet, Internet Engineering Task Force here, because they, they, I think they did a really great job at being here, presenting, telling the world what they were doing and how they could interact in the future. And as a last one, before I give my compliments, that when I tweeted well, I'm going tomorrow, I'm leaving to the, the, the IGF, and then someone who follows me on Twitter that I don't personally know said, eh, thanks, I know your passport number, and I know your birth date, and I know all your phone names because the database has been hacked and it's on the internet. Mm -hmm. So in other words, if we talk cybersecurity, cybercrime, etc., etc., at the IGF, so let's protect our own website as a community and protect the personal data of the people that participate here. Having said that, I want to give my great thanks to the people who organized it from the IGF and Indonesia and Bali because I've never been to a more friendlier IGF than this one. Yeah. Sorry, I, I need to, if I can just ask for one second. Did I hear you just say, did you just say that the, web, the IGF website was hacked? Well, that is open and anybody can access it. But I got a tweet from a, a, a law professor in Leiden saying, uh, I just know what your passport number is, I know what your address is, I know what all your full names are and your birthday. And that's exactly what I have to fill in okay. on the IGF uh, So can we, can, so we'll take this off, uh, off the, obviously off the microphone, but we need to get, a, we need to get that information from you as soon as possible. Gentleman over there. I'm going to take it back to uh, points from the previous gentleman who, who brought up the subject of IPv6. My name is Martin Levy. I'm from a company that um, has focused on IPv6 for years and years and years. And I'm going to tell you a wonderfully positive story uh, from this IGF. The local hosts and the local network operations center that is operating the Wi-Fi and the network here 
has provided you all with um, both IP version 4 and IP version 6 networking. And the mass of devices here have used IPv6 quite successfully. I'm going to ignore the little hiccup on the Wi-Fi a few days ago. Um, we'll just continue. But the percentages of traffic have been in the region of 20 to 30 percent, where the general populace of the IGF um, uh, attendees, predominantly non-geeks, have been using their predominantly out-of-the-box standard laptops or, or, or smartphones or tablets and have successfully pumped quite a, a lot of IPv6 traffic in and out of this, uh, um, out, in and out of this venue. The other thing is I got the tour of the Network Operations Center and I want to provide a shout out to the, to the techies that are sitting back there uh, running everything, um, all local and wonderfully smart. They gave me a, a quick rundown. Everything done with standard hardware available off the shelf, standard connections to their uh, local Indonesian telcos, no special work done whatsoever to deliver IPv6 with inside the four walls of this convention center. So for those people um, that still go back and either talk to um, their local uh, universities, to their local governments, to, to, to service providers, and still have an issue uh, with V6, that shouldn't be the case in 2013, and this is as great an example as any that IPv6 can be delivered to the masses without a problem. And um, the final shout out is thank you for the infinite amounts of tea and coffee that have been provided. Um, this is a vast improvement. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Nenna, and I'm speaking on my personal behalf. I want to just make four quick sentences. The first sentence is that the video quality, the quality of the video of the opening ceremony that was put on YouTube is not very good. We can't exploit it very well um, from the media perspective. Uh, the second is that I would like to put it to the mag and the organizers that we should plan IGF with an intention to make the physical participants smaller than the e-participants. I think if we have it in mind that we have more participants outside of the IGF venue, that will help our planning. On that, um, I've been tracking the e-participation itself, and I would like to say that the, there is a lower level of e-participation this year, but this is not necessarily due to the lower quality in the e-participation technical details and platform, but in the time difference. There is a huge time difference between Bali, Indonesia, and the most of America, Africa, and Europe. And that explains um, the lower level of uh, engagement from people uh, participating online. And I would like to still continue my last sentence on e-participation and say that in Baku, and I do recall in Nairobi, with the help of Diplo, we had a social media team and that social media team was very effective. And I was actually hoping that we would have a better social media team here, and I'm a bit disappointed on that end. I'm one of those people who were tweeting, but unfortunately, I could not tweet in French. So I'm hoping that by next year, we will have a multilingual social media team that will help um, chat more, engage more, and get more meaningful and valuable input from remote and even online participation. Why do we need these people and in different languages? Because people look at things different ways. I didn't have people tweeting gossip about 
idea because we are so engaged. So we need people to tweet content. We also need people to tweet people. And that is what makes remote participation very interesting. I hope we'll be able to pull this off by next year. I'll be happy to contribute in my individual capacity from my Twitter handle, which has at least now 5,000 followers. Thank you. Thank you very much. Very valuable uh, input and feedback. And I don't know who was first, so you three can fight amongst yourself. Matthew? Matthew. Okay, thanks, Chris. Um, I'd just like to say what a fantastic job this has been that's been done by everybody. Um, considering the various states of lack of uh, clarity as to what was going to happen with the IGF, um, I think I really would like to say my appreciation. And I'd really like to call out the Secretariat because I can only imagine... Uh, Chengatai, if you can just get up for a second, please. I know you'll get this in the next session, but, but honestly, you know, the Secretariat... Having experienced the workings of the MAG firsthand, I, and I you know, appreciate the work the MAG does, this has not been an easy task this time around, and it's been a fantastic event. And the, end, the best way for me to illustrate that is to say that it was a terrible decision whether I go to one of three workshops or a focus session. And when I'm in that particular type of situation, I know this has been a success. The only thing I would say going forward is if we can start the review process as soon as the IGF is over. I know that's a lot of work for the MAG. I'm sure there are many of us here who would like to help with that. But starting the planning and the review for next year at an earlier basis, we have big issues to address, still have to address funding, still have to address outputs. Um, so let's get started on that and build on the success. Thanks. Is he made? Yeah. Balance, baby. Don't go out. <laughs> Thank you. Um, sorry, my name is Izumi Aiz. I'm from Tokyo and civil society. Also, I'm a member of the multi-stakeholder advisory group. Why I asked Valence, my friend, to stay is in addition to the efforts by the Secretariat, and I'd like to really thank and commend the works of the local host team. Valence is one of them, um, just taking care of the webcast and all the Wi-Fi connection despite the lower budget than they wanted. Um, and with that, we really had a good um, environment in which we could really spend uh, or, or focus on substantive discussions. I organized one workshop um, about the power of the Internet to deal with the disaster and climate change. Balance was a hidden and hero on this uh, effort in Indonesia, together with the colleagues working since 2004, about how to cope with the disasters or afterwards using the technology. And I was pleased because I organized a similar session last year in Baku, but this year we saw an increase of people and half of them participated are from Indonesia and half of them again are the first time comer to the IGF. So I'd like to invite more comments as Pinda or others mentioned as being the first time um, participant because your input um, here now are uh, very, very taken seriously and to improve furthermore of the quality of the IGFs to come. Um, really, um, you, you should really guide us. Um, with that, um, there I saw several developments or new um, actions being discussed here uh, by different people met first time or a few times um, on the road. And I'd like to just uh, share one such a thing uh, from my friend who just had to leave last night, Penfa An or An Penfa, who we discussed to open up following the uh, summer school there. We'd like to have some Asia Pacific uh, regional summer school and down the road um, next year, Ju June or mid-June, likely in Hong Kong. We'd like to reach out to the youngsters more about how significant these will be in the years to come. Last but not least, perhaps, that in addition to asking the question to the government why you come here, I'd like to also ask some governments why you are not here. I just heard that from uh, my friends that some governments are seeing this as 
not really legitimate international um, governmental meetings, uh, or IGF not being a sort of interna international organization in such uh, status. So I think we should convey more of the serious participation of the governments together with the private sector, technical community, and civil society makes their legitimacy more or our legitimacy more so that they can go outside the box. You may be aware that there are not too many governments from the region are participating. Um, that's a pity. And so we'd like to really uh, focus on these for the, the next IGFs. Thank you. Thank you, Zumi. Um, and I'd just like to uh, also agree with Zumi that as a, a member of the multi-stakeholder advisory group, really encourage um, first-time participants to, to share their experience uh, at the mic. Um, please do. Um, Olivier? Uh, thank you very much. Olivier Crepin Blanc, Chair of the At-Large Advisory Committee in ICANN. Uh, I've got a few personal comments I'd like to share uh, with everybody here. Uh, the first one is that I've thoroughly enjoyed this IGF. The uh, maturity of the discussion has increased so much over the years that it's, uh, it really is showing now uh, the fact that it's, it's uh, coming into the, the deep part of the discussions. And uh, I think that we do have some discussions that are reaching a point where we're, um, we're reaching conclusions. And that's, that's a good thing. And certainly the level of engagement has increased in enormous amount. Uh, that said, uh, there are a few concerns that I have, certainly re with regards to the uh, theoretical aspects of some of the discussions, uh, the uh, principles of multi-stakeholderism, the principles of capacity building, a little bit like uh, my um, colleague and, and friend uh, Vladimir Radunovich uh, from Diplo Foundation, capacity building is extremely important. Let's just stop talking about the principles of capacity building, but actually go into implementation of capacity building, and that requires funding. And funding is the big elephant in the room here. There is not enough funding for capacity building to bring people to locations like here to be able to discuss things face to face. Remote participation is great, but being able to meet with like-minded people in the corridors of the room, uh, corridors of the center, outside, is something that you cannot experience by having remote participation. So there needs to be funding from all sorts of organizations, especially I would, I would ask the private sector. Um, there are millions of companies out there that don't even know that this forum exists and that the discussions that start here eventually give rise to discussions that will affect the internet and the internet business model as we know it. There are very few funders, very few sponsors that actually bring people uh, over to these, these fora and that's really deplorable and I hope that there will, they will, uh, will be more funders effectively for them. In fact, some of, the, some of the volunteers that come here are so determined that it takes several days to come here. I'd just like to uh, note one person, Baudouin Chambé, who's sitting at the back of the room over there. He's taken three days to come here. Did he walk? Days. Was he walking? Um, no, he was just stuck around airports around the world, one thing after another. But he is here, and that's what's really important. And I think that all of the people who are here really want to come here. But there are a lot of other people outside these walls that have wanted to come here, but that were not funded to come here. And that's really, really deplorable. One of the problems which I see is the coverage of the press. There is not enough press coverage in the mainstream media around the world. I just looked at the BBC website. The technology page talks about the uh, Twitter uh, IPO, talks about the Amazon um, reducing its losses and, and about all sorts of other things, but it doesn't talk about the Internet Governance Forum. Oh, yes, it certainly talks about the new GTLDs, the four new GTLDs that, that are um, IDNs, internationalized uh, domain names that have been released, and that's an excellent thing. But as far as the forum is concerned, it's very, very difficult to find information. So, of course, you cannot blame companies for not knowing that this even exists if they can't read about it in the mainstream media. So that's really the, the few points. And I do hope that uh, this, uh, this last point is heard by the media so that we're actually able to go and reach more people out there because this is really something that will affect them ultimately. Thank you. Thanks, Olivier. I guess we need a... An, I, an IGF press office, check it out, big one, lots of, or something, something exciting needs to happen that the mainstream media can come and look at. Paul, you're next. Thanks, uh, Chris. Thanks, Susan. Um, Paul Wilson from AP Nick. Um, 
Uh, as the IP address registry for the Asia Pacific, we're really excited by this uh, IGF event in our region, the second IGF only in, uh, in Asia, the first in East Asia. We were really keen to see um, the event well attended, uh, well supported and successful, and I think it, it has been. It seems that um, it may not have been the biggest IGF, but it's certainly been, been a great success. The, um, the local uh, multi-stakeholder organising committee does deserve a huge um, round of thanks. I'm sure they'll get, they'll get plenty, but I just want to give, give, give credit to the fact that they do, did organise themselves as a fully multi-stakeholder committee. They put um, all the work required to, to have this, uh, this event happen uh, with some hitches that I think most of us were probably aware of along the way. So, so really a, a huge um, effort and I'm very glad that in the Asia region we were able to, um, to pull this off. Um, I think and hope that this event will help to launch and to maintain a higher level of Asian participation in the IGF because I think uh, certainly by population and even by absolute numbers our, our participation from this Asia Pacific region has been, um, has been a little below the others. Uh, one of the things that we did spend some time on um, in the lead up to this meeting was the regional uh, Asia Pacific IGF meeting which was um, also a pretty successful one in terms of its numbers and, and all of its, um, its measures. It also was organised by a multi-stakeholder uh, Korean uh, Internet Governance Alliance, a fantastic um, effort by them. Uh, I'd like to mention that we have, uh, at that recent uh, Korea meeting, we were able to announce the next Asia-Pacific Regional IGF meeting, which is going to be happening in Hyderabad, in India, in um, dates to be announced, but likely early August in 2014. And so um, I hope to see Asian friends, Asia-Pacific friends and others uh, converging on Hyderabad next year for that meeting. And I'd also like to put in a plug for the regional IGF uh, multi-stakeholder steering group, as we call it. You can find the, the details on rigf.asia as the website for the regional IGF. And the multi-stakeholder steer, steering group is open for absolutely anyone who's interested to join and to participate in the, in the um, planning and preparations for that meeting. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. I've got some questions for the room in a minute, but Pindar, you're next. I, I guess you, you've seen Paul in action. Um, uh, Azumi was saying, you know, comments back from a first-time uh, IGF attendee. Uh, Paul, you know, the, my attendance here was really actually because of Paul and his uh, meeting in Singapore at the Apricot Conference. And so my perspective has really stemmed from two areas. One of which, as I said earlier, I was an IGF skeptic. And in, 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 in the Apricot meeting, uh, he said, look, you know, you've got to really understand what this is about you have to come and be here. So why don't you try and organize a few sessions? And so uh, with Adam's help, with Paul's guidance, and with other support members, I organized a session uh, on the, an Asia-specific issue at the APRIGF, and then an uh, issue here with the trade issue, which was introduced. The problem as follows, which in terms of pitch, uh, that I had to get uh, other uh, trade bodies interested in the IGF was, well, if you don't make decisions, why is it important? And I think I can answer that, and the reason why I'm no longer an IGF skeptic, having come here and organized these sessions, is I think you have something very, very special here. You have a sense of community. In other words, that sense of community has actually been established over many years of everyone coming to these meetings, and what you have is really trust building. And so whilst I see the, Paul's sort of initial uh, uh, call for having more commercial participation, the real thing here is that there was flexibility in the system to gather people around for an event that no one could have foreseen, right? The Hong Kong Snowden disclosures. And then to have this flexibility within this arena to actually be able to address that. That's incredibly valuable. Why? Because no one could have predicted it. And so organizational-wise, it's, it's very clear, this is a tight, you run a tight ship, congratulations. But the real value, although I, my earlier intervention was that you've got great intellect in the room, you've got great perspectives in the room, what I think you're really doing here, and what I think you've been very, very successful at, is raising the level of trust. And I think, especially in this current environment, that is extremely valuable, because there's no other venue that is, what you, would, what you guys have determined is you've defined 
the multi, what it means to be multi-stakeholder and multi-stakeholder principles. Don't undersell, don't undersell that. What you've got is extremely valuable. The community you have is extremely valuable. And I think that's worth stating. Thank you. Pindar, thank you. And I agree with you 100%. I am, I, I, I've lost track of whether it was last year or the year before. We had an example of a number of governments coming to the IGF with a particular model that they were proposing and actually being prepared to sit up on the stage and have that model discussed by the room and, and taken to pieces effectively by the people in the room. And this morning I think you saw another government being prepared to actually sit up on the stage and talk about something about which I wouldn't, you know, I'm not surprised that they'd be uncomfortable talking about and you might not necessarily agree with everything they said, but the fact that they were prepared to do it and do it in this environment is critical and it's what makes this, the IGF thing uh, so valuable. Right. Just to build on that, the reason why I think the trust issue, because, because we're in such a new domain, we're all going to make mistakes. And so my earlier point being here, these massive surveillance, clearly that's a mistake. But with trust, you can build in what I would call forgiveness. In other words, we, okay, we, we all made a mistake, full disclosure, let's figure out what that's going on, let's fix it, and let's move forward. You, you know, friends make mistakes. We have, you know, married people make mistakes. You know, they get into arguments all the time. But the strength of the relationship to move it forward is really based on, I would hope, a positive vision of the future and the, the implicit trust that we'll get through this. And I think that's the trust that you've built here is significant, it's meaningful, and I think it's extremely valuable. So congratulations on that. Thanks, Peter. I can't see who that is over there. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. My name is Mary Uduma, and I'm from Nigeria. This is not my first IGF, um, but I will say that um, my my interaction here um, throughout the period has been very, very positive, productive, and engaging. Um, IGF had afforded me opportunity to meet great minds, great people, and make friends. It had given me opportunity to interact with others and share and exchange um, knowledge. There are positive outcomes, but I have some um, some worries in terms of what happens after this talk. We are building bridges, enhancing multi-stakeholder cooperation for growth and sustainable development. The, that aspect, growth and sustainable development. It brings me to the fact that, to the point that I am from a continent or environment that affordability, availability, and sustainability are still challenges when it comes to internet. Yes, we are talking about remote participation. It's when you have access that you can participate remotely. It's when it is affordable that you can participate remotely. And when it is available, you can participate remotely. I did not attend all the workshops. I know that this, um, the, the, the event has its theme, and maybe the sub-themes were woven around there, but I don't know whether there were workshops that, that were devoted to this. But I must commend the um, W3C for the new, new alliance, Alliance for Affordable Internet. I hope that we all will be part of it and make sure that Internet is affordable, is available for those of us that are coming from the developing country. I should, I, I, will, I will say that there should be a workshop on how to make Internet work in the developing countries, especially the least developed. And um, some of our governments, just like uh, one of the speakers have said, that they don't see what is in here for them. Uh, it's not a, a treaty-making uh, process. 
It's not a process that will help them change, help anybody or enforce by any person. So um, they don't come as such. But in my environment, it's the government that moves the working. That they are the ones when they lend their weight in any process, it works. So that's what we should consider as well. Um, but I must say that the organizers have done great job for us. We had a lot of food, a lot of a lot of uh, fun. So thank you for this, and um, we hope that more developing countries will come, and internet will be made more affordable, available, and uh, uh, accessible for the developing countries. Thank you. Thanks, Mary. Um, we're going to go to the gentleman there in a second, and then to Sebastian, but Shadi? Yeah, just a very brief <laughs> a clarification um, about, um, um, it, it wasn't actually WTC, it's, it's the World Wide Web Foundation. It's very similar, it's confusing. They were both initiated by Tim Berners-Lee. Uh, the WTC, the World Wide Web Consortium, is the technical body, and the Web Foundation is um, um, what uh, works with the uh, uh, alliance that was that was mentioned. Thank you, sir. Sorry, the man who spoke is W3C, and I am Web Foundation. Just in case you need to put name faces to the organisation. Perhaps you could wear badges next time, and we could, or hats maybe. Hats would be good. Don's a, Don is in favour of hats. The gentleman there in the in the hat, bizarrely, sir. My name is Onegito Ekpe from Nigeria. This is my first time. I really thank the Indonesian government for the wonderful trip they have given to us. And my appreciation goes to Diplo Foundation. They created the awareness of uh, IGC through their online learning. I knew about the IG. I had to save and today I am here. I give God the glory for also giving me the enablement. My own is basically those people that have been trained should be able to have a track to know who they are impacting. And there is also a need to make government that are using these e-resources for their daily businesses to participate fully. Also, the companies that are involved are expected to do a whole lot of funding, either by establishing a foundation to support the IGF. My third issue goes to the civil society. We need a platform that could really define a regional integration at the international, at the national, so that there will be transparency and accountability at all levels. For instance, if we are talking about multi-stakeholderism, how do they organize their structure at the international platform? That's my question for the civil society. Thank you. Thank you very much, and thank you for being prepared to get up to the microphone uh, on your first IGF. Uh, Sebastian is next. Bonjour. Bonjour, ça va? Très bien, merci. Bon. Je vais parler en français. Oui. Non, c'est pas Sébastien Belagamba. Sébastien Belagamba est. Euh, Sébastien Bachelet. Elle a les mêmes initiales que moi, mais il est euh, d'Amérique du Sud. Euh, Sébastien Bachelet. Je suis français, je suis membre du board de l'ICAN, euh, sélectionné par les utilisateurs. Je suis aussi membre du conseil d'administration de l'AFNIC qui gère le point FR et qui a aussi été sélectionné par les utilisateurs. Alors, mon nom, c'est S-E-B-A-S-T-I-E-N-B-A-C-H-O-2-L-E-T. -E Merci pour le transcript. Je suis quite like Bashara, though. It's got a ring to it, hasn't it? Euh, donc, ce que, ce que je voulais dire, la première chose, euh, euh, nos amis euh, chinois ont beaucoup utilisé... Euh, la, la possibilité de parler dans leur langue euh, maternelle euh, pendant cette, euh, cette réunion. Euh, je pense qu'il faut encourager l'ensemble des participants à utiliser leur langue maternelle, qui sont euh, en tous les cas traduites ici, puisqu'il y a sept langues différentes. Euh, ça donnerait une impression euh, un peu moins anglophone et un peu plus internationale. Et ce serait vraiment euh, très bien. Le, le, 
un des intervenants précédents a, a remercié les, les organisateurs et, et trouvé que c'était un des meilleurs IGF. Je voudrais dire que la chaleur du soleil était dehors, le froid de la climatisation était dedans, mais la chaleur des cœurs et les, les échanges dans ces, ces réunions ont été vraiment fantastiques. Et je pense que le lieu où nous sommes a aidé à, cette, à ce que ce soit « smooth running » comme disent les Anglais de cette, de cette réunion. La euh, troisième chose que je voudrais dire, c'est sur le, sur le fond, il y a eu beaucoup de euh, sessions sur le multi-stakeholder, sur la participation euh, de tous les acteurs. J'espère qu'à un moment donné, il y aura une, une synthèse de ça, parce que j'ai eu l'impression qu'on l'avait décortiqué dans tous les sens possibles, euh, le rôle des gouvernements, le rôle de la société civile, le rôle des acteurs techniques, le, le rôle euh, de, de la liberté publique, etc., etc., euh, une synthèse de ça serait très, très utile et pour un dernier mot merci à tous les organisateurs euh, de cette réunion merci Sébastien um, so we've got three people at the microphones Marcus Kuma needs five minutes of our time at the end and we need to finish a quarter past so I'm going to close the line right now uh, and we'll take Pindar first and then Desiree and then Salah. I just wanted to share with you in terms of again having more commercial participation in the IGF, the experience from this IGF when we invited the W3C uh, Web Payments Chair. Again, uh, the W3C Worldwide Web Consortium which builds these core protocols. Um, I guess the feedback was a, uh, one of a little surprise uh, that um, a lot of members in this group and you know, wasn't aware that they're trying to build payment into the core of the web. This is especially important for, again, routing money on the Internet. Um, but to give an example of the reward, again, um, the what W3C chair came. We've uh, uh, found out about this wonderful IT event uh, in Addis Ababa at the end of this year, which is, again, part of the celebration of the 50th uh, founding of the African Union, where they're planning their technology plan 50 years ahead. So the example here is not just the information, not just building trust, but also serendipitous events which you know, we could not have planned for that. That's exactly the audience where, again, new, where they don't necessarily uh, you have opportunities for new technical development. So these are the reasons that I'll be taking back with me why it's important to come here, not just the information, not just building trust, but also it also makes good business sense. Thank you. Thanks, Pinka. Desiree? Thank you. My name is uh, Desiree Milosevic uh, with Affiliates. This is my um, eighth IGF and they all been very different and I'm uh, very proud that I have been able to come to all of them um, so far. And I think I agree with some of what's been said previously that, it, um, that we have a great community here. There's a lot of trust that is being built um, within this platform. Uh, but I think more importantly, it is important to say that it has been a very inspirational platform for a lot of academics and, um, and the events that have been um, as pre-events to the IGF and the further outreach should be done to the academic community to come and harness all the rich discussions that we have had in uh, many uh, workshops and uh, public policy debates. One thing that I do remember from the main session on the access and diversity uh, when we discussed uh, with Sustain Plus uh, the Millennium Digital um, the goal of the um, MDGs and was the, the, the fact of best practices. And uh, uh, before I forget and go back home, um, I'd like to say that it would, might be a good suggestion to have some of the organizations like the Internet Society deploy and so on. Uh, to come up with a half a day or, or a suggestion how to better deal with uh, sharing of best practices among regional and national levels. And uh, lastly, um, this is proof that it has been an inspirational platform. We now have this uh, uh, Brazil meeting as an additive process to the IGF. So thank you all for working on that. Thanks, Desiree. Sala? Thank you, Susan. Salah Tamaniko Amaro for the transcripts. Just thought I'd uh, speak to the issues that the gentleman from Nigeria raised, and uh, it was actually we facilitated a workshop um, at this IGF on MS multi-stakeholder selection processes 
in terms of increasing accountability and transparency in which um, critical leaders of uh, uh, critical stakeholders were represented. And one of the common threads uh, that they mentioned was that there needs to be a clear criteria and particularly a greater clarity in terms of definitions and uh, that sort of thing. Um, one of the other things also is um, the issue of legitimacy, competency, geographical diversity, uh, inclusiveness and democratization and youth. And one of the things that came up certainly was that the different communities have their own established norms. The technical, uh, technical community, the business constituency, where they agree who the focal point is. But in moving forward, if we are to enhance multi-stakeholder cooperation, we cannot sugarcoat the issues and we need to uh, address in very clear and tangible ways within the different sectors how this is going to play out. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Sala. So before I hand back to Marcus, um, I want to say thank you to everybody who stuck around this afternoon and was prepared to come um, to this open mic and obviously especially to those who spoke. And, um, and you should stick around as well for the closing ceremony because A, it will be short, I'm reliably informed, and, and B, there will be some speeches worth hearing, I should think. But in the meantime, perhaps you should give all of yourselves a round of applause. Thank you very much. Well, thank you all for your feedback. I came here, I was prepared that people would throw tomatoes at me or whatever, but I think the feedback was extremely positive. Uh, and I tend to agree. I think it was really a very good meeting. In true IGF tradition, the best IGF ever. We have always improved and learned from previous meetings. Of course, there is room for improvement, but uh, I very much appreciate that Pindar's comments as a first comer, that the, we really managed to build a climate of trust. And trust is extremely important especially at the time when many say the trust, the circle of trust has been broken. So we really have to work hard to re-establish that trust. And I think the fact that there is such a platform where you can have these discussions is extremely, it's invaluable. It would have not really, I think it would not have been able to take place anywhere else. And, and also the maturity of discussions, we have witnessed that over the years. It, I remember the first meeting we had in Athens, it was Nitin Desai then made his, one of his analogies with the Indian weddings, boy meets girl, arranged the marriages and they're not yet ready to talk to each other, they're very shy. But gradually, I think we have grown to get to know each other, in yeah, not in the process. <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> We have learned to talk to each other and uh, uh, really a, a discussion, the one we had this morning, would have been unthinkable five, six years ago, I think. Uh, now, of course, there is room for improvement and thank you for your comments. And uh, one thing, today we end the meeting and the planning for the next meeting has to start tomorrow when we said we had a MAG meeting yesterday. We will start the review process as Matthew had suggested. We'll start, with, we'll start with online discussions. We will ask, obviously, for community input. We will have a meeting next February, then a physical meeting. But yes, I think we have improved the sessions, but again, we can do better. Uh, the colleague from Nigeria asked the question, what next and what is in it for governments from developing countries? It is not a treaty conference. No, it was not intended to be a treaty conference, but we took up a challenge we learned at the treaty conference when many representatives from developing countries said they had a problem with spam. So we organized the session that had experts around the table on how to deal with spam. Now that is not a treaty, but you can learn something and there will be uh, links to papers where you can actually find something, to websites, to specialized bodies, the MOG, the London Action Plan and so on, where there are practical solutions. 
And as one participant mentioned, I think it was Desiree, the idea may be to have pre-events, technical training before the IGF came up as a suggestion. We have we didn't build in these pre-events to begin with. They just sort of mushroomed, and there are now many of these academic type, the GigaNet, and the idea of having a technical training event uh, could be an excellent addition uh, to the IGF, that we don't discuss policy, but we mix policy with uh, technical training. And it's also a very positive development that we have seen more and more uh, really highly specialized engineers attending the IGF. This time, for the first time, we had the uh, chairman of the Internet Engineering Task Force. They are techies. They're deep down in the plumbing of the Internet. They don't talk politics, but they became to realize that actually this is important for them to talk to policymakers to make sure that they don't make the wrong laws or make wrong regulation that would actually have a negative impact on the internet. So this is an extremely positive development, I think. And yes, there are many suggestions of organizing the sessions. We talked about giving better, having more impact, more tangible outputs. We tried, and I would be the first to admit we're not yet there. We tried to organize the sessions in a way that would allow to reach conclusions, but on some of these issues, it is extremely difficult to reach conclusions. Questions of principles on multi-stakeholder, there are widely divergent opinions on internet governance principles, but we had a very good discussion on this, and we can continue the discussion. The same on the role of governments. I think we moved towards a middle ground, where converging ideas, where we see uh, there was one panelist, to name her by name, already sitting there, who said actually that late in life she came to the conclusion that governments actually did have a role before she didn't think so. And we all agreed that there should not be opposition between governments and other stakeholders. No, they should act in partnership and governments had a particular role, but they should work with the other stakeholders to make the Internet work properly. And, okay, so let's discuss then on how to improve, how to make a better next meeting, make the next IGF even better. Uh, clearly, uh, a room set up like this is not particularly conducive to a discussion, and the comment was made at the roundtable hollow square setting we had on day two and day three was by far better suited to have an interactive discussion here we revert back to the plenary mode because we have a formal closing ceremony, but we could also have put the session maybe in another meeting room, except had we done that, we wouldn't have the benefit of interpretation and also the real-time transcription. So there are always pros and cons. But definitely uh, the sessions should be made more interactive. And the comment was made, that was the starting point. We said that when we started, we want interactive sessions without presentations. And maybe we collectively as MAG, we were not tough enough on that. And I think we need to be tough for next time. We don't want time eaten up by panelists with presentations. We want interactive discussions. I had positive feedback from the flash sessions. Let's go more for flash session. In the ITF, they call that sort of thing birth of a feather. Uh, let's learn from this and let's move more towards interactive sessions. And also, uh, obviously, moderation is important and I think we really have to insist on moderators reaching a conclusion, trying to drive the discussion towards a conclusion that would then respond to the demand for having a better impact. So with these Word, few words. I would like to thank you all for your extremely valuable input. We will try and start an evaluation uh, on the webs on the IGF website, so that everybody can give a electronic input. But I think this very first input was extremely valuable. Thank you very much. And now we adjourn for 16 minutes. And please be back.
4.30 sharp for the closing ceremony. Thank you. Thank you very much.